Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 1 series. Mary discusses challenging addictions. Recorded on the 14th of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. All right. Well, who think wasn't Corny awesome? Yes. He's off. Oh no, there he is. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to be talking to you about challenging addictions. Now, who feels that by now they have a good intellectual grasp of what addictions are? It's been covered a fair bit, hasn't it? Prior to coming here as well. We all know, do we know the layers of addiction? <coughs> covers the anger, covers the fear, or the anger above the addiction. We all kind of think, okay, I've got that on. How many people feel that they have made serious inroads into changing their addictions in the last... How many, how many years have you guys have been listening to Divine Truth? Five years, four years, three years? Two years. Anyone here under a year? No. Okay, who thinks in the last year they've made some serious inroads into changing their addictions? Two people? Three people. Don't know if I can agree. <laughs> maybe, maybe. And maybe some of you who haven't put your hands up also. And some of you have, perhaps. But is it, has it been life-changing? Has it been like my life a year ago compared to now is completely revolutionised? No. Do we agree that for the main part addiction still drives desires, actions? Yeah, yeah. And what do you feel about when Cornelius and I talk to you about the feelings of addictions today? what it feels like to want them, what it feels like to get them, what it feels like when you don't get them. Who feels like they're pretty in touch with those things in their life? Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. When you say in touch, you mean like fully in touch or just have some awareness of like, yeah. <laughs> so kind of know it goes on. What I mean is in day-to-day -day life, how often do you catch them? How often do you? No. Uh, not many, really, and not much. And if we're going to challenge and change our addictions, or release our addictions, if you like, we're going to have to get really good at that, aren't we? And this is where you engage this process that Jesus outlined to you yesterday about the intellectual awareness, the intellectual desire, getting now into the soul kind of a des awareness and desire. And for a lot of you, I feel there is still that soul awareness lacking. But what I'm going to be talking to you about is moving, f once you have it, once you've moved through some intellectual layers, and a lot of you have moved through some intellectual layers, haven't you? Can you tell me five addictions that you have? Each of you, I reckon, you could. <laughs> yep, yep. Everyone agree? Like, you've done some intellectual work here. So today I want to take you from intellectual, how are we going to get to this emotional awareness and when we do, how are we going to move through it. But before I start, I want to just tell you a little bit about my journey with this. Because to be very honest, I would say me desiring and engaging the process that I'm about to share with you, I haven't been doing it for very long maybe a year. And that's because there's work involved. There's change involved. And all of you are going to have to go through those changes. So let's rewind a little bit and remember, what did Cornelius cover with you? He covered three main factors of why we fear change. Who can tell me the first one? Uh, Kate? We have no faith in God, true faith. 
So we, we lack faith. And there was two parts to it. The first part was we lack faith in God. And what was the other thing we lack faith in? Joy? Also in ourselves. In ourselves. Mm. In our capacity to change. Yes. Yeah. Okay, what was the second thing that blocks our change, Diana? We lack the willingness, the the development of our own will to That's make that That's a effort. lot of what I talked about after Cornelius, oh. wasn't it? And I'll refer to that as well. But there was a second thing. If we go to Joanne at the back. Um, no desire for truth. That's the third thing. So desire for truth. It's really interesting that this is the one that no one can think of. Uh, if we go to Dane. Uh, we believe we can't cope with being overwhelmed emotionally. Yes. So can I call it for the purposes of our discussion, fear of emotional overwhelm? So that all our fears are connected to false beliefs. Our fears are false beliefs. So we believe we can't cope with it. So that means we're afraid of it. So fear... of emotional overwhelm. Okay, so, so who's shocked that Mary, who's lived with Jesus for five years, just started challenging her addictions in a sincere way in the last six to 12 months? Yeah. And when I say challenging, I mean me for myself. Living with Jesus... My addictions got challenged, like 98.9% of them got challenged on the first day, and then the second day, and then the third day, and then I left. <laughs> Maybe not it was the third day. How long do we last, honey? I was angry by the fourth day. Oh, I was probably angry by the evening of the first day, I'd say. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I hid it with a lovely facade for another, you know, 48 hours and then it was off, you know. So my addictions were being challenged. External to me, my addictions were being, to cha being challenged. That's happened to a lot of you, hasn't it? With Jesus and sometimes with me just starting, challenging your addictions. And then I got angry and I fought and I didn't want to see it. Because... I had zero faith in God or myself. I was really, really terrified. I'm not talking a little bit. I'm talking massively terrified of being emotionally overwhelmed. And at that point, my desire for truth, well, it hadn't really been developed at any point before then. And so our first year of relationship was pretty rocky. And we were off and on and in and out of relationship. The challenges kept coming to my addictions. I didn't want to know about them because I, these three things terrified me. Then something grabbed me. And that's a big quality of our soul. There's a desire for truth. There was no change in these two things. I still had zero faith in my ability to change, the fact that there was any hope for the world with God. I wanted to believe that, but inside, no faith. And I didn't want to be emotionally overwhelmed. But the truth got me. You know what? He's telling me the truth. And I want it because it feels awesome. And I know there's a purity in that. And I want that purity. I want to strive for that. So back I came. Then we had another two pretty rocky years. <laughs> Honestly, it was pretty hardcore. There was a lot of projection. There was a lot of challenge. It never stopped because that's my darling. He tells the truth. 
and he has personal standards and ethics and morality. There's no change. And so what happened? The challenge kept coming. You know, I did a lot of this stuff. I tantrumed, I cried, this is so hard, I can't do it, I'm just withdrawing, I'm controlling, I've got to do something, I'll divert, how can I get a sense of worth, maybe I'll do a blog, maybe, you know, there's got to be something. Because I don't want to do this thing, I don't want to be overwhelmed. And then after another couple of years, it got so full on, my desire for truth was pulling me, that eventually I broke down and I began to feel my lack of faith. So it wasn't intellectual anymore. This was emotional. This was desolate. This is there is no faith. I feel like there is no hope. I'm not good enough. I'm not made well enough. I can't do this. I can't. I want to, I love the truth. I want to believe this is true. And actually, there's a soul feeling in me. It's possible. But I'm fighting it because all my emotional damage is saying, you can't. You're just not good enough, Mary. You're not even built that way. Other people can do this. What's wrong with you? So I had to move through a lot of self-punishment, the addictive self-punishment that I had in place to avoid this desolate lack of faith feeling. And then, more time passed, more of these feelings came up that God, you don't, you love, I know you love everyone else. I feel it. I'm so passionate enough to tell people, but it's not me. It's not me you love because I'm the damaged, shitty thing, you know? It's not going to be me. And I understand it, so don't worry. (laughs) But there was a lot of crying about that, you know? And in that process, I started to have a chink in the emotional overwhelm. It got so much that, whoops, I'd done it once. And actually, (laughs) by complete, honestly, guys, and you're going to go through this feeling. You're going to go through this feeling of like, it's too much, I can't do it, I just can't do it, I have no faith, I can't do it, I can't do it, I have no faith, and you'll surrender to that emotion. And once you do it, this is when change has a possibility to happen. This is where we can start to find that will muscle that I talked about, the will to love. And once you do it once, then you go, okay, I'm going to do it again. So about a year ago, or maybe two, I'm so bad at judging this. My soulmate says two, I say six months, you know. (laughs) I always go through something, I go, I wasn't even trying back then, now I'm doing it. <laughs> but maybe two years ago, I went, this is it, I want to change. And I want this faith that had been just totally smothered by my feelings of desolation and hopelessness started to bloom again. I went, okay, I'm going to go for this. I'm still terrified of emotional overwhelm. There's so much fear in me about that that whole emotional experience. I have so many false beliefs about it, but I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try for it. I'm going to challenge that. And then a little while ago, I started to stop relying on the external challenge of my addictions. Stop relying on my soulmate to go, "Uh uh-oh, there you are. Uh Uh-oh, there it is again. What are you doing here? (laughs) And I started to sense it for myself. I wanted to feel the sin inside of me and to heal it. I didn't want to just keep trying to get away from it, get away with it. I wanted to find it and now I wanted to change it for real because my faith had grown. And my feeling that emotional overwhelm, that it was the end of the world, maybe not the end of the world is maybe just a small catastrophe that I seem to be able to move through and it's getting better and better. But I wanted to tell you about that, guys, because everything that we've been talking to you about this week links to the other. It's all there to help you guys on this process, but don't expect that it's going to happen instantly. You know, it's going to require your will. And... It's taken me that long, seriously. 
But if you love truth or if you can find some sincere desire to love or to grow yourself towards something that's positive and to change that cycle in relationships that Cornelius just talked to you about, to change what seems like this endless cycle of never being really satisfied and actually feeling quite unhappy underneath, then you can engage that will and start to grow the muscle. So this process I'm going to outline to you is about how to challenge an addiction. Once you have this intellectual awareness that I know so many of you have, but it's going to require engaging your personal desire to do it, to become sensitive in a way that you're currently avoiding. And when you do it, it'll start to get easier, trust me. And it's like the whole world will light up in terms of sensitivity and then you go, oh, 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 oh gosh. Okay, I'm going to have to keep dealing with things. And it's a good thing because some of you mentioned you start to feel better about yourself. You start to realise, oh, it's not so much ickiness I'm doing with people anymore. I feel more frightened, I feel more challenged, but it's not so icky all the time. So I just want to encourage you as we start looking at our steps. Everything that we're talking about, if you engage it with your soul, that's, that's the, the soul loves feeling, you know. It's just getting back in touch with your soul. Okay. So what's the first thing that you've all done with your addictions? At this point in your progression, Eloisa. Begun to intellectually recognise them. Yeah, you've noticed them, haven't you? You've noticed them. Okay, the first step in challenging addiction, not surprisingly, is you have to notice it. Okay, but there's a second part to this first step that I feel a lot of you are missing at the moment. Matthew? Um, I guess intellectually, like, get that it's not very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm loving. going to challenge you to emotionally recognise that it's a sin. Because a lot of you go, oh, this is probably an addiction, right? But, you know. <laughs> and you, you ladies have a good laugh about it sometimes, don't you? Like, oops, that was me and my addiction again. And I'm telling you that when you become emotionally sensitive to your addictions, you won't find it funny anymore. You are going to feel like, oh, yeah, that's something pretty yucky that has effects on not just me, but everyone around me. And when I choose that, even if it's just me choosing my cup of coffee, I've suppressed a fear and that's affecting my relationship. Because what's the major block in our relationship? It's fear, man. This feels yuck now. This feels like a sin in me. This feels like something that's not love. And this is the step that I want to encourage you all towards is because now it's, easy, it's, it's kind of like a place to hide where you go, I've got all this intellectual knowledge about addictions. I'm just going to stop them using willpower and just stop doing it. And, and eventually your life ends up feeling like really rigid, doesn't it? Because you're trying all the time. I'm not going to do that. 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 Oh, no, that's an addiction, right? I'm not going to do that. But in it, you have missed this really important step that's going to kick you off on this emotional process which is to feel it, feel the unlovingness of it, feel the sin. I'm going to call it a sin because I can't think of another short way to say it. Notice the addiction and recognize, recognize the sin emotionally. Mm -hmm. 
And Joy and Barb, I wasn't meaning to single you out there. I was just because we'd done it recently uh, and recognised the... <laughs> oh, I know I was being truthful, yes. Okay. Notice the addiction and recognise the sin emotionally. What might we do next? Uh, yep, Diane. Engage our will to change. Yeah, look, this whole process is about engaging our will to change. So let's, let's break it down really piecemeal. The first thing we do is we want to recognise the sin emotionally and this is all about waking up our sensation of emotions. So we might notice these emotions, feel them emotionally. Oh, I did it and then, oh, yeah, I got that warm, fuzzy feeling. And suddenly you'll find that the warm, fuzzy feeling feels a bit sleazy, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah? Okay. Okay. And this is, this is an important part in this process, you know, you, often then you feel the sin and then you don't want to feel the warm fuzzy because you're like, oh, now I'm judging it. Yeah, I don't, I'm not even going to get satisfaction from this now. You know, feel it. Feel your way through this process. So, feel, feel the response you have. And if you like, if you're not engaging, if you're not in, engaging the compulsion fully, feel the response that you want to get. Feel the response emotionally. Okay. Next important step is a don't do. And I already mentioned it. Do you remember what I said? Laura? Stop them. Yeah, no. Don't, what do you got to do at this point not to do? You've, you've noticed the addiction and felt the sin. You've felt the emotional response to it. If you go back to Karen. You said don't judge. Don't judge it. Exactly. Who's, got, who's fallen off the, the road at number three and judged? Yeah. It's easy to do that. You've just connected to this is a yucky thing that I'm doing to the world around me and myself. And, oh, I just liked it. <laughs> and now I want to judge it because I want to stop it. And our adult facade thinks this is how we're going to control that hurt child. I'm going to judge you and stop you and you're not doing that. And we're not even going to admit that it's there. That's the temptation. Either self-punishment or de back to denial. Because remember, before this, we're in denial of the addiction. Emotionally in denial. So even if we have the intellectual awareness, we're still emotionally denying that it exists. And it's tempting to go, oh, yep, yeah, oh, now I feel the sin. Oh, I feel like I like it. Oh, now I want to judge it and go back to denial. The thing to recognise is self-punishment, as I said earlier, is just another addiction, it's just another way to stay away from feelings that you judge as more difficult. So at this point, don't judge it. Tell yourself the truth. Why is this addiction here? Why is the addiction there? If you think about me riddled with addiction, what were the three things that I believed? I had no faith. I felt I couldn't be overwhelmed and I didn't want the truth. This addiction here is, for, is, is here for one of these reasons. Tell yourself, okay, I'm not going to judge myself about that. I, I can work on those things. I can work with this now. And hey, there was damage done. I've got to, if I'm going to change, I'm going to undo it. Judgment shuts that whole process down. Does someone have a question while I was talking? No? Okay. What, com what comes next? And, you know, I should say, as we go through this, sometimes these steps that I'm going to say to you, sometimes they happen in a bit of a wonky order. 
And sometimes they happen really, some of the steps happen really rapidly and you didn't even notice it. So don't get caught up in this checklist one, two, three, four. This is just a way of showing you what will be involved emotionally in releasing an addiction. Okay. All right, what's next? Let me look at my notes. All right. Okay, so a lot of you alluded to this when you said, just stop it. We're going to not feed the addiction. Remember we said it was like a cookie monster? So we're not going to feed it. But the crucial thing here is your motivation. Remember I said earlier, a lot of us have gone, oh, yeah, intellectual awareness of addictions. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm stopping it. I'm stopping it. And it's willpower at work then. When our will to change and our will to grow is engaged, we want to stop feeding the addiction because we want to expand the emotion that's underneath. We want that. We want to know and feel what's under this addiction. And this is where our will to love, our will to change is getting, it's growing. As we're going through these things, it's growing and getting engaged. Paige? Thanks, Deirdre. She's cottoned on. If you stand at the back, you get to see where the people with their hands up are. Is using our willpower another addiction? Well, yeah, we're trying can to it prevent. Be? It can be, yeah. We're trying, to, we're trying to... Often when we use willpower, it's because there's been a chink in our facade. <laughs> Something's been exposed that we don't like. So we want to go back to having this facade where we're perfect, so we're just going to stop the thing that's judged as bad. Like, I see that happen a lot when people hear a bit of divine truth and they go, oh, yeah, coffee's wrong. Oh, I don't do coffee anymore. You know, it's, it, it's about saying, you know, I've progressed, but a lot of times it's because there's a, a willpower in force. And it's, do you know why you do that? Matt? Uh, Nina, have you got the mic? No, he's got the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Lake, do you want to pass it to somebody else? Cause I know you're so engrossed there. Corny, would you mind? Yeah, thanks. Because I don't want to think of myself, feel of myself as a bad person, really. Yeah, it's a, it's a working of the, of the facade and because we're afraid yeah. of other people's judgment, actually. Big time. Yeah. We're perceiving there's going to be judgment coming towards us. Now... I just told you how long it took me to engage the process of challenging my addiction sincerely. I'm not a judger. <laughs> Trust me, this guy here, uh, Jesus, not a judger. Cornelius, not a judger. The people who are teaching you about this path, we're firm for truth because we love it. But there is not, we are coming from our own damage. We know what that's like. I know what it's like to be terrified of being emotionally overwhelmed. It's not going to stop me telling you the truth about it, but there's, I'm not going to judge you about it either. Yeah. Okay, so willpower, yes, can be an addiction to keeping our facade page. Yeah. Okay, did I write it up? No. Nope. Um, oh, gosh. Just stop feeding it. Thank you. Stop feeding it and what's the crucial bit in it? Why are we stopping feeding it? Thanks. Could, yeah, it's okay. Because we want, you know, it's fine to yell it out. Because we want to expose the emotion underneath. We want that. We know that feeling that emotion underneath is going to what? Get rid of the addiction. So we want that for the first time. So we stop feeding it in order to expose the emotion. What happens next, do you think? Matthew? Um, you get really overwhelmed at, or attacked by spirits. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Well, overwhelmed 
is more like you have a sincere desire. Well, no, you can get attacked by spirits. Whether you go off on the path of listening to the spirits and complying with them. Yeah, which I usually do. Sorry? Which I usually do. Yeah. That exposes that the fear of change is still higher than your desire for change. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Joy? I think because I've heard you say this is because you want to feel how badly you want it. Yeah, well, actually... that's what happens next. Actually, right. that's what happens next in this process is that you oh, sorry stop feeding the addiction in order because you want to expose the emotion. And the next thing that pops up is, oh, I want it bad. I want the feeling of the addiction itself. You, you have the opportunity to feel it right then. And you know what's linked? Has anyone experienced that? What's linked in there is all your... And some of you might have. I'm not saying none of you have. Like, yeah. But what's linked in there is all of the false beliefs that have been driving this addiction. Oh, I can't do it. I can't go... No, 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 no way. Fear, oh, you can't feel... There's, and you've, you've just got to... Oh, I really, really want this thing. I really, I've got to have it. Like, oh, no. You know, if I don't get this, I'm going to feel something I don't want to feel, you know. And it's a really emotional place. It's different from total panic which is another avoidance. That's, whoop, I want to go back. I want to go back up these steps. I don't want to feel this properly. But it's like a uh, feeling and, a, and things start to get exposed to you in that place. Okay, so we're going to call that feeling the addiction. Like it's, it's almost an emotional entity on its own. Fabio? Deidre, can we just have the mic, thanks. Um, just, I'm just inquiring, does it feel like sometimes that it's, it feels like there's this like, worms under your skin and it's like, feel like you're having an exorcism or some sort of things going on? Just when you're not feeding it, when you, when you stop feeding it, you feel like... Yeah, I, I have felt physically uncomfortable at times, like... Like I yeah. feel like there's stuff underneath my skin and I don't... Yeah, I think that's very entirely possible. No. Anyone who's dealt with physical addiction actual drug addiction could vouch for that feeling as you're detoxing, hey? If we get a mic, yeah. It actually feels like fire running through your veins, basically. There's no blood, it's just fire. Just fire. And yeah. you're sort of screaming More internally that you want that substance Basically. Again. Yeah. And you become quite sick and everything else. Sorry, you get quite sick? Yeah, quite sick. And yep. Yeah. I don't think it's that dissimilar from an emotional perspective. Yeah. Alwyn? Thanks, Dave. So if I feel relief when you say we don't judge it, are you feeding an addiction of mind to not being judged? You know, because I felt such relief. Yeah. No, I, I don't think that was an addiction. I think that was some sadness you have about feeling judged in the past. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Rachel? Sorry. <laughs> well, what I noticed is that a lot of, I get a lot of awareness at that place about the place that I started this process and I'm wondering if... Um, because I feel like there's a pure desire underneath. Like my, for me, it's about feeling loved or whatever. I feel like I shut it down so much and, and actively like, right, I'm not going to need anybody. And so I did the opposite. And for me, it's like opening up. And I'm wondering if that's just creating another addiction. Do you know what I mean? Or I'm not quite following you. Okay. Can you give me more detail? So well, you, feel, when I start, you, you feel like there's an unloved feeling in you? That you suppressed I, with an addiction of like, no, I'm tough, I don't need love? No, I feel no. my compulsion to get that addiction met to be loved. Yep. But then when I start to feel about it, it opens up the intellectual awareness of, you know, the whole sort of story with my dad or whatever that, um, you know, he didn't want 
he didn't yeah. sort of have that love to give or love to me, so I just shut down. And I also shut down a pure desire to, you know, to, to feel yeah. love, basically. Yeah. And do you feel that's an intellectual process that happens, Rachel, or is it emotional? I feel like it starts with an emotional thing. Like, I feel like it starts with an emotional thing and then the awareness comes about this other stuff. But I'm just wondering if that next step that I do after that is, I'm, I wonder about that. I, I think I see what you're saying. Correct me if I go off the track. So you get to feeling the addiction and it seems like you start to feel into the next step that I'm about to present and then an awareness comes... Oh, and this does happen as you deal with addictions. Oh, you, you also gain an awareness of, oh, that's not just here. I do it there and there. Oh, and actually, yeah, I start to feel like something with Dad, this is about. And then, oh, you're in your head kind of analysing it. Is that what you mean? No. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, I think... Uh, I, I, don't I, I don't understand what you're asking. What is the other addiction? I guess I'm wanting confirmation that I'm not just going back into and not, that, that, that underneath that there's a pure desire to be loved and that that's okay, you know, that that's because that's what I tell myself that it's okay to want to be loved. Yeah. Whose job is it to love us? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when we're at one with God, who will we, who will we feel should love us? Nobody. Nobody. We'll feel the gift if someone does love us, but we won't feel like we need it yeah. or that, you know, it's okay to, like, take it sort of thing. So I, I do agree. I feel like you need to be careful in that area. Yeah. But is it still okay to want to be loved without... Yes, You know yes. what I mean? To actually be open to... <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I feel like part of our, a lot of problems that we have is being open to being loved. But just be careful of the want part of it. Yeah. Like you're already having a sense, is this addictive? Yeah, yeah. And I would take notice of that. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think I just need to get more emotional clarity for myself. <laughs> yes, know. yeah. But I would trust the emotional sense that you're having Yeah. that maybe there's something else going on. Okay, thank Did you. Did anyone else follow that? Did they, you're okay with that? Okay, good. All right. What are we up to? We are... Let me just write up the step that we've been talking about. So we feel the addiction. We feel it. We feel our desire for it. We feel the false beliefs that we have about it. We don't think they're false at that point. We're just feeling them. But our will is still engaged. I want to get to what is driving this addiction. I want to expose the emotion that's driving this addiction. And we're not there yet. Okay. What happens next? Did other people have questions? I had hands before I wrote up. You're right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, Karen, then Paige. I just wonder if you could finish that part where you said you're in a feeling and then you start analysing it. And what would you have said if she said that was what? <laughs> oh, if you get into a feeling and then you start analysing it, that is a, an addictive way you get away from the feeling. When you want to know what it's about, it's actually fear-driven. I want to know what this is about before I keep feeling it. I want to know what it's about before I continue. Can anyone else relate to that? Yeah, yeah. It's just a product of your fear. Paige? I was just wondering if you could give us a practical example of actually... Doing this? Yeah, feeling the addiction. Feeling the desire for it, feeling the false beliefs. Okay, yep, yep. Let's just... Like an illustration of... Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's fine. Okay. I think, what if I just finish this 
and then we run through a quick example to end yep. because I'm going to ask you as homework to engage this process while you're here. Glenn, just next to you, Paige. Yeah, um, I, m my addiction was to put Kate to Deirdre. So... Um, Do you think you're over that one, Glenn? No, no. Yeah. but I'm trying to work through it. Yeah. And I'm challenging her cons on it, but yeah. I still haven't dealt with it because... I really got to deal with the addiction in me, um, but I well, see all it the addiction is in you. Yeah, yeah, I realise this, but I see it coming. Just hold them. I see it coming to me. What um, do you mean? From from a, from um, Deidre's addiction to want to control me. Yeah, just be careful Which there because you just mixed up your addictions. Yes, your addiction belongs to you. Yes. Deirdre's addiction belongs to her. Yeah. Now you can enter codependence about those Which addictions. We are. Yes. But. Because Deidre wants you to meet an addiction yeah. that you've been willing to meet addictively, yes. who's responsible for dealing with that Me. addiction? You. Myself. Because you just said you see the addiction coming towards you. You can see her addiction, yep. but that's not yours. No, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Um, I know when I got to a position, it took me four days to even bring up in me to be able to speak the truth. Of that I felt, I felt controlled. Yeah. And and I couldn't tell her, and th it caused a big fight. And after the fight, we started actually telling, we started telling each other our truth. Yeah. And um, the one for me was that I was feeling controlled, and then I had to look at the addiction, which which I felt this fear inside. I was so scared of telling Deirdre what I felt. I think you're confusing a few things here. Okay. You're calling fear addiction. Okay. Deirdre's, I agree, Deirdre's addiction is to control, but that's her addiction. Yes. What you're not examining is your addiction okay. that made you happy with control in the start of your relationship. Okay. Now, that's not an addiction to control. Okay. It's an addiction to something else. And you're right, underneath it... Yeah. Partly is the fear of speaking up and saying the truth. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think your addiction is? To... Um, Isn't uh, it to please the woman? To please her. And to be a bit paternal with the woman? Yes. Yeah. And what do you get out of that? Um, if you're in this cycle and you do it and feel, she thinks you're doing it great... To feel loved... You want to feel loved? There's yes. more? What else do you want to feel? Um, I want to feel like I'm a good boy. Yeah. First uh, and foremost, you want to feel like Glenn's a good guy. Yeah. yeah. I'm good. I'm You're nice. Good. I'm nice. You're a nice guy. I'm a nice boy. Exactly. Yep. All right. Anyway, yep. let's move on because we, yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to feel the addiction. So Paige, you asked me about what does that actually feel like? feels like you really want it. So if we go through, well, let's start on the example because I'm not going to have enough room on the board to finish my steps. So let's start with a really basic one that I did on the way down here, okay? So coming down to the assistance groups, it's a whole new deal for Mary. You know, I've been involved in the organising, I'm going to get up and talk to people, there's a whole heap of people coming. What are some of Mary's biggest fears? Fear of judgment, fear no one's going to like me, fear no one's going to think I'm a nice person, all these things. And I'm going to get up there and I haven't even finished my outlines and actually, but I don't want to feel any of that because we're busy organising, okay? And also, you know, I want a bit of control. It's all pretty out of control, you know? All my food's being cooked. Oh, what am I? You know, what if it's not okay? I've done the menus, but what if they don't do them the way I want? And, and how am I going to feel comfortable if I feel out of control? I know. I didn't think this, but this is what I did. I made a collection of sugar-free raw cacao treats for Mary to bring just so she could just have them in her room and, you know, if, you know ever just in the evenings could just have one. That's pretty reasonable, isn't it? Like, anyway, on the way down here, we stopped at Kyabra. And 
Someone made a passing comment to me, so I can't say I fully engage the recognition of this addiction on my own, but you can do that, and I have started to do that with other ones. But someone made a passing comment to me, and I immediately went through the intellectual awareness of what was going on. Oh, crap. Oh, I can't believe I've just done this. This is all because I'm feeling, like, terrified of the outcome of how everything's going to go, and this is my little comfy blanket. All right. So... I now have some faith. I now feel like, nah, I want to get rid of these addictions. It's tiring anyway. I just had to do that in the midst of... I had to make all those little ball, coconutty balls in the midst of all the other stuff that we were doing. You know, this is not working and it's helping me avoid a fear. And, as I mentioned earlier, what's the biggest block to my soulmate who I now have a desire to connect to? It's my desire to avoid fear constantly in my life to placate my fear. So, no, nah, I've had enough. And it feels yucky. I felt the sin. I felt like, yeah, yuck. I don't want to be that anymore. It feels gross. And the response emotionally, well, really, I did the two at once, didn't I? I was like, yeah, I can feel what I want out of this. I just want to feel a little bit soothed. I just want to feel a little bit like there's something at the end of my day. If everything went bad and I couldn't remember anything I was going to talk about and the meals were crap and everyone hated me and then someone got angry with me, I just wanted to go back to my room and have my little cacao coconut ball. <laughs> I knew what I wanted from it and it didn't feel very good. Okay, I've, I've done enough work on self-punishment that I did not judge it at that point. I just went, you guys are staying in the fridge. Right here at Kyabra, we're going down without the chocolate. And guess what I got to feel then? Awesome. This is scary, but awesome. I have the opportunity now to expose some emotions. How was I ever going to deal with my fear if I had my little comfy blanket? I want to know what it's like to not rely on those things and challenge myself. I've never done that properly. Here we go. New environment, new people, new menu, n lots of responsibility, lots of fear-triggering events. Let's go. I want to know what's underneath this. Feeling the addiction. Again, remember I said these might be a bit mixed around? I probably felt it up here. I felt like, nah, I want to. <laughs> it's not really bit of rationalisation, you know, like, it's not that big a thing. And if no one had said anything to me, maybe no one would have noticed. And, <laughs> and this feeling, the, the, the feeling that I had really around this time that I was making the cocoa, cacao, coconut balls, was a lot about this feeling of the addiction, like, I want to not have to feel out of control. I don't like feeling that un, un, insecure in my environment. So that's kind of what it's like, Paige. It's like, I want, please, please, I need, you know, that kind of feeling. And you do have to pass through that. Yeah. And you do it somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. And I... It, Laura? Um, uh, for example, when you work through the thing just with the chocolate, it would open up to something a, a lot more that would create other addictions or is this just one particular subject of an addiction? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, could that same emotion that's causing that addiction then create a lot of others that would automatically uh, go yeah, away? Yeah, yeah. But while I'm still engaged in the other addictions, am I going to get to that emotion? So I am going to have to want to challenge all of these addictions. So that's what I'm saying, that even if you get to the bottom but then you want the electric blanket on at night time to keep, you know, that's still another one that you'd have to... Yeah, I could have engaged other ones. And in fact, there was one that I picked myself up on before I, that didn't even have to get mentioned to me. And that was, you know, we're coming for five weeks. I want... Again, just a little bit of familiarity. I want some tune out. I want... So, um, there's no internet, which actually I'm okay with that one. But, you know, there's no... What am I going to do? There's a week off and... Oh, still fears of emotional and physical intimacy with my soulmate there a bit. So, let's just... We've got a TV series on DVD. 
we'll just just copy that off, bring it down. So in the evenings, if I just want a bit of tune out, a little zone out, a little avoidance, then I've got it. But it seems pretty reasonable. I mean, what are you going to do on your week off? You know, I could rationalise it. But I went, and so these are some, this is a similar fear driving the two addictions. And with that one, I went, oh, this is what I felt the, I felt the compulsion. I was like, whoa, something is going on here. You're very invested in getting these in the car. What's going on? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, Mary, oh. And I went through, again, quite rapidly, because now I'm getting in the flow of it, and got into, no, nah, the decision is already made. As soon as I'm sensitive to that sin, no more. And so I think as you begin to engage this will to love, you're going to challenge a lot of addictions quite often. <laughs> and I've still got other addictions in place, for sure. Like, for sure. Um, but you, so you're going to... And as actually, let's just keep going through the steps because when you get to the end, you might find out, oh, I've felt a bit of that. Now I notice a whole heap of other addictions. So it's, a, it's something that you go through, you know, again and again, and more sensitivity. Remember I said at the beginning, your soul wants to feel it's so sensitive, but we're just far away from it in our day-to-day -day life through all the facade and addictions and denial of the hurt child and suppressing it all. You know, we're shutting it all down. And as we get more sensitive, then we get more sensitive. Then we get more sensitive and we discover more. So it's, it's not like you have to have it all done and dusted or, or pick out all the addictions and do them all at once just trust the process yeah my feeling was more like if you, when you when you did that chocolate thing that you wouldn't get up from feeling that awareness and then want a cup of tea like that would automatically yeah because that's an effect of the same emotion that was driving the chocolate definitely yeah. and my desire to really sincerely challenge myself this week made me sensitive to the dvds made me like go oh yeah I wanted to get that one past the goalpost, but I'm not, I'm not doing it, you know, so, yeah. 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 Okay, um, Barb? Um, in that description there, you focused on using your will to, um, to overcome that addiction or face that addiction. No, uh, I didn't. My will was already engaged to change. Okay, your will, yes, was true. I want, it, I want it, so this wasn't my willpower. Yes, yeah, so I'm, what I was reflecting on is that I've actually used my willpower in those situations, not my actual yeah. loving will. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I, I emphasise point four. You're gonna, this is when you're really going to start letting go of addictions is when you do it not because you should, not because it's because it might take some force of will if you like it might like when you still have this addiction in place so you might have to say no i'm not gonna but it's going to be pretty easy because you want to expose the emotion a lot of us have been trying to challenge addictions but at the same time don't want to expose the emotion that's yeah. underneath them yes and that's that's been the error of using my will, will force power, or exactly. will power yes because i still have been avoiding the emotion I've achieved the end result in quotation marks. Yeah. The physical type ones I'm talking about, not emotional yes. ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's only been done by my will force, using my will force, yeah, my well, will power. Like yeah. Lots of us have done it when we've lost weight, gone on a diet, gotten fit. Though I'm doing it, 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 I'm doing it. And we get all thin and svelte. And then we still want to eat the food at the end of the day and we put on five kilos again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joy? Thank you. It's almost like I need a step zero to say, okay, what have I just done or what do I want to do? Is that an addiction? Like, before I get to notice the addiction. Yeah, and remember I said at the beginning, this is, we're starting now with some intellectual awareness. So that's your intellect. What did I just do? What have I done? Why did I do it? So you, you're looking at your, inter this is when you start to engage the emotional process of releasing the addiction. Suzanne? Mary, would it be accurate to say that willpower is what you need over a long period of time and will is what you use spontaneously to get yourself moving in the moment? Well, if you remember, that, remember I had the table up here the other day, will versus willpower, yeah. and I said 
Will requires effort and increasing effort over time. And will, sorry, willpower. 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 And will is the thing that's already engaged in your soul. It's already happening. It is your soul's true desire. Right. So in the case of you leaving the chocolate in the fridge, it really didn't, it was a natural continuity continuity of the decision or the realization yes i had mm. the i had the intellectual realization oh this is about me avoiding that fear that i know that i've got going on that i actually want to deal with so i'm i'm leaving them behind so you didn't need any force at all no i'm maybe for a couple of minutes i went yeah, oh. but, yeah, yeah. but then i went no i don't want to yeah, yeah. understand Thank so you. the will to change is important in this process yeah so you can still have addictions in place and grow this will to change and to love. And that's going to make things a lot easier in your decision-making process. And the will is a response to the realisation, not a force to discipline. That's right. Well, no, the will is not a response. The will is already in play. Okay. So remember I talked about at the beginning where I had the fear of overwhelm, the lack of faith the lack of desire for truth. As those things grew, so d as those things, as I dealt with those things, my desire to change desire. grew. Yeah. And that's my will. Yeah. Got it. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes huge sense. To yes. Yeah. And I, yep, if you, okay. I should just say, like, I'm grappling a bit to put it into words because it's fresh experience for me. <laughs> um, but I think that's exactly what I mean. So, <laughs> if you go behind you to Graham. <laughs> Just staying on the same example, um, an emotion came up uh, that exposed a fear, was it? Was that the emotion that came up? You mean when I decided to leave the balls? Yes. No, this is where the emotion's coming up. I'm not with you, I'm sorry. So, the addiction... The addiction, remember, is in place to help me avoid the real feelings I have. Yep. So I have a desire now to challenge my addictions. That's part of my will now. So, and that grew through dealing with the fear of overwhelm, the, the lack of faith, the lack of desire for truth. So now I desire to challenge my addictions. So someone pointed out I'm in addiction. I intellectually realised that. And then the desire to challenge that addiction kicked into play. So the desire to expose the emotions that I had underneath the addiction came into play. I went, no, I'm leaving them behind. And for those two minutes, if you like, so my will, is, my will to change is growing a lot. So this feeling of the addiction is it's not as intense as it once was. So I felt for a couple of minutes, no, man, oh, this is scary what's going to happen you know that was my little lean I'm going to was going to lean on that and then I let it go and I got in the car and drove down here where the emotion was always going to be potentially exposed anyway by standing up here in front of you guys by managing different things throughout the week does that make sense yes there's still something that I'm not clear about yeah if you've dealt with the emotion then I you, haven't. Oh, you haven't. Remember, because the addiction you could is in still place. potentially make the chocolate balls again. No, remember, the chocolate balls are the addiction. They're not the emotion. And deciding to stop the addiction is not me dealing with the emotion. It's desiring to expose the emotion that's driving it. Yeah. And I could go and if I said, no, nah, I don't want to expose this emotion anymore, this was really intense, I couldn't answer five people's questions properly, I'm going to make chocolate balls, then I would, then, then I would be acting against this, all this process that I, just, that I just engaged. I'd be going, oh, my will muscle would be like, nah, it's too hard, it hurts now. Mm. And I wouldn't have dealt with the addiction. Mm. But perhaps we need to keep going with our steps mm. because I think, I think it's pretty clear and I think once you see some more of the steps, you'll see how it comes to fruition. We're only halfway through, okay? We take more questions at the end, hey? Okay, so is everyone got to there? Because I'm about to wipe them off. Yep. Uh, yes, I am.
I'm just conscious of our time as well, so. I also think we need to be aware of intellectually engaging with this process and trying to understand it. The fear in you is going to make you want to do that. Oh, I've got to get it, I've got to get it. What is, what is she talking about? If you start on the steps, <laughs> start growing that wheel, dealing with the things that cause you to fear change, then just keep this in mind as some tips when you get to that place. Fear makes us want to get rigid and get it right and sort it out and all of those things instead of just trusting. Okay? All right. Next step. What do you think? We've decided we want to expose the emotion. We've felt oh, the feeling of the addiction that's been living in us for a long time. What might start to happen next? Two, six. We, Steve? We might start to feel the cause of why we have that addiction. Yeah, and who did it, what did I talk about yesterday? Which self do you think we'll be in then? The hurt self? Yeah. So we start to feel the feelings of the hurt self. And this is where a lot of what we talked about yesterday comes into play, doesn't it? This is where a lot of everything we've been talking about kind of links together. So this hurt self, we're going to have to acknowledge that they're there, aren't we? And allow their feelings. And our, remember, our addiction has been there to keep us away from those feelings. Diana? Sorry, Mary, I just realised you'd said leave questions to the end, so I'm happy to do that. Oh, yeah, like. let's do that, hey? Let's, let's keep going. So we're going to feel the feelings of the hurt self. Now, remember I talked about this morning this anger, feeling it brings us no closer to truth or God or growth. But sometimes when you connect to this hurt self, you might feel sad, afraid or even angry. And this is where the childhood anger that AJ talks about comes in. But it's very powerful and often very brief. Okay, so feelings of the hurt self. And knowing what you do about the theory of addictions, what do you think might be the dominant feeling that you feel first? Fear, fear. Okay, so what's going to happen then? Any ideas? What, yep, Teresa? You'll start to, you'll start to see why you wanted the addiction. Um, like feel the reasons for it? Yeah, well, you. this is really the reasons for it, isn't it? But as I mentioned to Laura earlier, it's not necessarily done in one go. It's not like, oh, that's all over, that, that's finished now. Often what happens instead is that, something we've talked about already in this talk, is that you get an increased sensitivity to what else is there, or how pervasive this addiction is. At the moment, we have this kind of intellectual concept that I know what that addiction is about and, you know, this is what it's about covering and all of those kinds of things. And then when we get into these emotions, we go, oh. When we start to connect to the hurt self, we go, oh, wow, I want to avoid this feeling in a lot of areas in my life. And there's a more to this feeling than I thought. And actually, there's some more addictions I've got. So we just get more sensitive and we also get more sensitive to the cost of the addiction. Do you know what I mean by the cost of the addiction? 
the pain it's been causing myself, the pain it's been causing others living in this, catch ourselves in, in some form of the addiction again and we feel, oh, we feel the sin more strongly now. And this is where it gets awesome because the cycle continues. You go, oh, now I feel the sin. No, actually, oh, it feels gross. Now I want to expose the emotion that's under this. And you start to feel more like, oh, this is working. I'm changing and I want to do it more. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to honour the increased sensitivity. We're not going to shut that down. We're going to say, no, that's good that I know about that. Oops. And eight is we'll revisit it until, until we're done. So revisit the whole process. Bob? Um, Mary, I don't want to harp on this chocolate thing, <laughs> but if I'd gone through all of those steps and I was willing to feel the addiction attached to having the chocolate balls, because yes. I love my Brazilian chocolate truffles, yeah. does that mean I would have them as an enjoyment then? Like, I'm thinking, shit, am I never going to have these again in my life? And what does that, what, is, what are you doing right there? <laughs> Feeling the addiction. Exactly. Okay. I can't live without these. Do you know that went through me as I was driving down in... Oh, I can't remember. It was sometime in that period where I made that decision, I'm leaving them behind, I was like, oh, wow, old friends, maybe I'm not going to want you ever again. Yeah. You've been with me for like 35 years. Yeah. So you're not going to want them again, but you'll have them as a pleasure thing. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can I please keep them sometimes? So... So does that mean I don't serve them anymore when you come for lunch? <laughs> Jesus is nodding. I'm still working through the addiction. <laughs> yeah. So you would never, ever have those things again? <laughs> Bob, why Sorry, don't you set yourself the challenge? Deal with the addiction, see what happens. <laughs> I think I'd still like to have... <laughs> Exactly. This is the feeling of your addiction. <laughs> now she's got the giggles. <laughs> All right. Okay, Karen. <laughs> it's about the chocolate balls in the fridge. Guess what? <laughs> um, when, we were, when you were talking about it, I was thinking, I can imagine trying to convince a small child the reasons why he might not want chocolates in the fridge or might, he might think of an alternative. Um, and I could feel that working rather than saying, no, you can't have them, but explain to him to get him to the point of where he um, could see that it was better not to have them. And from there I thought, like, and I think I do this a lot, I thought, I, um, I just feel very sad that I can't have them. But I'm missing out the fear then, so I thought, I must yeah, be Yeah, and track. you do exactly what you just said. You feel sad that you can't have the addiction, that's not feeling the addiction, and then you rationalise and say, oh, no, well, it's not good to have it anyway, and let's do this other thing instead. Let's have something healthy to eat or have an apple. You'll be right. And all of that is just avoiding feeling the addiction, feeling that you want it. Right. And you're going to have to let yourself feel those feelings. It's like if you try to intellectually dominate the process, you've just gone out of the feeling process. Remember, there's the intellectual awareness and changes that happen and then the soul process. And you, you're pulling yourself out because you don't want to feel. But the child is not feeling, the child me is not feeling that I want it. It's feeling sad that I can't have it. So that's not helpful. It's more no. helpful to say, I really want it and get upset. Well, you don't necessarily get upset. It's not like when you're in the compulsion phase. 
It's not like a demanding tantrum when I say feel the addiction. It's like, oh, I want it. But remember, you're already connected to the sin of it. You already feel like it's icky. But you can feel how much you want it. And because you're in this process of desiring change now, there's, there's less indignation about it, but it's still there within you. Does that make sense? You're yeah. not justifying its existence anymore, but it still exists and you have to feel through it. So if I jump to feeling sorry for myself that I'm not getting it, it's a waste of time. Yeah, that's sort of like self-punishment in a way, isn't it? Okay. It's like self-pity. Right. And that's avoiding the process. What I do. <laughs> okay. Luli and then Alwyn on the other side. Thanks. Um, I struggle with the first point, um, <laughs> which is the recognising that it's a sin emotionally. Yeah. Because I see some of the other stuff, but then I, because I think I don't recognise that it's a sin emotionally, I don't really have the motivation to give it up. Yeah, I see. You're not feeling the cost of it even. Yeah, and I'm, big, yeah. yeah. Or the, the sinful part of it. Yeah, and so I was wondering if you had some tips about tips how to that. become more sensitive to that. Well, I don't know, Lily. I feel that as one of 14 people who came back here who already developed their soul, there's a strong feeling of, like, truth. It's kind, it's, there's kind of the sin, once it's pointed out, weighs a lot heavier so I don't know. But I feel that, remember the three things about change? The desire for truth. Like I would expose myself to more truth about, even if it's intellectual, about the sin of it. Why is it sinful? Like consider that. But I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to help you more than that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, Alwyn? So when you put them back <clears throat> and you sort of face it, addiction, yep. did you immediate, immediately start to feel, you know, I mean, have you finished with that? No, I'm not finished no. with it. And, and, and I have a sense that uh, maybe when you start to feel that that, that that little feeling will just be a ripple that will be deep and deep and wide and almost... Never ending, you know, like it's a massive, massive thing, even though it's a little thing. Yes, oh, right. very often what we see is our smallest, insignificant, easy to rationalise addictions cover, like the fear in me is wide and deep, definitely, but it's not never ending. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. yeah. So have you done any of that fear stuff Yeah. Yet? Yeah. Well, just standing up here yeah, and, you're facing you know. It. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. But also when I went to do this talk this morning, I had a cry and I shook quite a bit because I felt ill-prepared mm. <laughs> and I felt that um, very passionate and I felt exposed, being very vulnerable about my, my progression so far. And a lot of that are things that I try to avoid through physical comfort and control you know, a lot of those feelings. So, for example, not getting up and giving talks or, you know, or being in a big facade with everyone all of the time. That's other aspects of the same, of the addiction, of other addictions that I use to avoid the same kind of emotions. So, you know, because myself, I sort of have this feeling like, well, now I've, I've got it, I've, I've, um, I'm, I'm starting to feel it. And I've got to go to the very end, right? You know, I, I can't leave it and come back to it. It feels like I've got to do the whole thing. And is that an so, addiction or a Remember fear last or? night I talked about the, the hurt self and treating the hurt self with love? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Fabio, I, I, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but let's take Fab. Thanks, Mary. Um, I understand the feelings of addictions, but there's, like, for me, for example, with, like, the guitar, you know, like, I notice sometimes it's addiction that I play it, but sometimes I just, even if I put it down, it's, I can't stop thinking about song melodies or chords. I walk down the street, I hear birds and I hear melodies. It's like I can't get rid of it, and I'm, like, 
I'm not sure if it's addiction or if it's desire or or where I am with that. Like I get it with other things, but yep. So how, what do you reckon you're f- going to do to understand the truth about it? Well, I've tried to put it down, and you know, but it doesn't stop me from thinking about music. It doesn't stop me about thinking about that. So kind the of addiction stuff. might not be guitar. It might be thinking about music. So that might be an addiction as well, and just challenge those kind of things. I don't know. I'm not saying I know the answer. Yeah. But I, if it was me in your situation, I'd go, does this feel like a compulsion? It, it, that's what I was questioning. Like I'm looking at that and I think, the And I time. think in terms of our discussion right now, let, we're not going to get to an answer. Yeah. I think it's good that you're questioning, is yeah. this a compulsion? Yeah. And this is, the, this is the process everyone has to engage. Like let me become sensitive to what's really happening emotionally for myself. Engage the process and even you can engage the feeling. I want to expose what's really in me emotionally and then you'll get more clarity. Remember God's universe is designed to bring us truth. How awesome is that? Like, So as you start to engage this desire, I'm sure that brings up fear in you, the feeling that maybe my music is addictive. Yeah, but it's never, it doesn't, it, 90% of the time it doesn't make me feel good. Like 90% of the time it connects me to me. So it's like I just try to, but there's 10% of the time where it feels great. Yeah. So it does bring up fear, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just focus there, Fabio. Mm. Like I feel the fear a little bit in your question. Mm. So perhaps just sit with that. Yeah. All right, guys, I feel like I've made a meal of it. Darling, yeah. Do you want to come up here? And one of the things I would say to Fab is take your guitar away for a month and how do you feel? I've I've done that. I've taken it away for a month and, you know, it it hasn't felt... And and did you feel sad or did you not? Did you you feel like you lost something or did you not? Like, see, see a person who has an addiction, you take something away from them and they have a whole heap of responses to that. So if you took my guitar away from me for a month wouldn't worry me at all. If, if I lost my guitar and somebody broke it, it wouldn't worry me at all. Does that make sense? Yeah, it would worry me though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So obviously there are some addictions involved with it. Yeah. So you could say in this case, you've got a pure desire to play music and you enjoy music, but there's also some addictions you play. So sometimes when I hear you playing the guitar, I can feel, yeah, you, ne- you, you have a neediness going on here now. Mm. Does that make sense? So you, you'll be able to feel those things. But the question is, if you take things away from you, what 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 is it that you what will happen? And I, I should re- I yes. just remembered I should be seeing you and my camera rather than <laughs> sorry about that, Igor. Um, yeah, so you know the the real issue you face is one of is one of being honest with yourself about what would be the true effect of the addiction being removed out of your life, and and would it make you sad? impatient, unhappy, uh, stressed out, uh, bitey with the people around you, you know, what will it do? Because all of those things indicate that there's an addiction not getting met. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. Get that. Cool. All right, guys. That's all we literally have time for. Does anyone feel like they understood what I meant? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, who feels challenged? Yeah, yeah, no, don't. I've, I am sincerely concerned that I've confused you. Are you confused? No. Okay, good. And I would just encourage you to come back to this outline, back to these steps as you start to engage some of the things that we talked about. Yeah. And hopefully we're going to have time for some personal truth sessions. I need to give you your homework. It's 20 past two now. For one. Okay. Okay. All right. So your homework is to challenge at least one addiction using the technique I described. So it'd be good to start with an addiction that you obviously already have intellectual awareness of, but you never know. You might go back to your room and suddenly have an intellectual awareness of a new one. But um, 
yeah, to challenge it and to journal about that process, what that was like for you or what it's like starting to engage those steps. Do you want any tips on areas where you might have addictions? Yes. Well, obviously in your interpersonal relationships, in your partner relationship, in your relationship with other people, as you're interacting here, you might notice that you're in addiction. Your eating habits and your personal comforts. Uh, yeah, you can start with what makes you angry, irritated or a little bit annoyed. Diana? Just next to you, Fabio. Would you mind just repeating that question? The question, sure. Thanks. So to challenge at least one addiction using the technique I described today in the talk. Now, did everyone get down all of the steps that I described? Yep, written down, yep. Yes? You can copy some, yeah. As long as you have a copy of the steps, that would be good. Um, and other areas, so you've got interpersonal relationships, your eating habits and personal comforts. Some of us are very controlled about our eating. Some of us are very uncontrolled, challenging either way. <laughs> um, technology. Stop looking at the internet, stop looking at your phone, stop looking at those kinds of things. That's a big addiction in the modern world. Yeah, and you could do, continue, continue these after you go home. But they're just three major areas that I see a lot of people have a lot of addictions. So you don't have to stick to them. Rachel? In interpersonal relationships, does it count if you tell them that you're going to do that? Why would you? I'm thinking about my older children and I you know, have concerns, fear about them and I, I want them to be okay, I guess. <laughs> this sounds a lot like an addiction, doesn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I don't need to say anything and even that in itself is part of it. Yeah, but also why wouldn't you be truthful with the people around you? I don't think, hi, Di, I've got an addiction with you, I'm challenging it, is necessary. But... Part of my addiction might be to be in a facade with Di. And so telling the truth to her would be good. Actually, you know, I really feel really insecure today or, or not seek her out to say it, but if it came up, you know. So, Rach, I feel like I'm not grabbing you today. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like there's an addiction to with your kids. Yeah, I know, and that's the, what I'm thinking about challenge. And I thought about it while I was here, the, and the fear about not contacting them at all. I've felt it a little bit, but I know there's the temptation to do that. And I'm just wondering what love would do, I suppose, you know? And I think it's different with your kids, hey, because often you, you have an addiction with them and you've set up an addiction in them. Yeah, that's what I mean. So I think with your kids that it's good to be honest about the fact that I set up an addiction in you. Now you feel like you need to hear from me all this time. And actually, I know now that we don't and it's not helping any of us grow, so I'm not going to do it. Right. You know? yeah. yeah, that's, I guess, what I was asking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Jesus, would you like to clarify anything that I presented today? Do you feel my answer was off right then? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, close ups. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel, you know, should some of the answers are definitely. No, 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 you stay Rachel? there. Should be you, Rachel? Well, you and I are talking, okay. but yeah. I feel some of the answers you've given are, have not been as confrontational as they possibly could be, ah. right? Um, if I refer to Rachel now, so I'll just do that. Just let me get Rachel in my viewfinder and zoom in on her. Oh. And there we go. There's Rachel smiling. <laughs> Rachel, um, you have heavy addictions with your children. 
you want them to share in almost every emotion you experience. And when you're sad, they're sad. When you're upset, they're upset. When you're afraid, they're afraid. And you've created that. Now, sure, what Mary said, telling them can help the situation, tell them that you are in heavy addiction with them. But, but what's the best thing to challenge any addiction is, is what God does. And you know what God does? God doesn't tell you a single thing. God just doesn't feed the addiction anymore. Do you know why God doesn't tell you a thing before God doesn't feed you the addiction? Because, yeah, <laughs> telling you something would make the fear go away and that's part of your addiction. Do you see? So, so from God's perspective, what God does is God just doesn't feed the addiction at all, doesn't tell you anything about it, doesn't inform you as to why God's treating you that way. God just does not feed the addiction under any circumstances. Now, when you became, become a parent at one with God, that's exactly what you would do. You would never feed an addiction of another person and you won't tell them. You won't even need to tell them. They might ask and then what would you do? You'd send them a messenger or you'd give a message of, yourself, of your own. God sends messengers to say, this is why. Right? One of the reasons why the three of us are here is, is to give you a message. This is why things aren't working. This is why things haven't been working in your relationship with God. But, but God only does that based on the desire of the individual. So have your children asked about why you're not feeding their addictions? So then, so then the best course of action would be to not tell them and stop feeding their addictions and see what happens. And when they get angry, encourage them to go through their emotions, <laughs> just like God does. Does that make sense? So whenever you try to allay or make go away a sensation inside of yourself, because this is what you're trying to do, by informing your children, doing it differently to what God would do, you, you're actually making a feeling inside of you go away. Not, not just them, inside of you, right? And that's an addiction. So you're trying to make the fear go away rather than just feel it and feel what it's all about. Does that make sense? So, so what I do whenever I have a feeling about addictions or feeding the addictions of others, I always ask myself the question, what does God do? What, would, what does God do with me when I'm in that situation? Oh, I, don't, I don't feel any love from God at all. I don't feel any, any connection with God at all. I don't feel any um, nice feeling from God at all. And I go, okay, that's what I have to do with this person. I have to give them no, no like while I love them, which is a state, I am, I'm not going to feed them with my love because that's going to feed their addiction. I'm not going to feed them with, the, with, with anything that will make their fears go away. I'm just going to state the truth and let it be. That's it. And that's why a lot of you don't like interactions with me, to be honest. That's why many of you go to Mary. <laughs> like, like, for example, like, like um, in the last week, um, I've copied many of your discs. Right, Mary gets the thank yous because she gives even you even when I say I didn't do it, Jesus did it. I don't get the thank yous. Why is that? Because there's a feeling you want from Mary, and you know you're not going to get it from me. <laughs> so you don't even bother thanking me for what I did for you. Right? That, that's what happens. Right? Because there's because you, firstly, you know I don't need the feeling from you. But secondly, you know that you're not get a, getting a feeling in return, right? When you thank somebody, quite often you want, oh, the acknowledgement, oh, I'm so glad to do it for you, oh, isn't that wonderful I did that? Yes, you know, and you, and you want that feeling. And so that's what you're going for, you see. And so, so we often have that. We, I commented to Mary about that yesterday. Like, I just noticed that yeah, Mary's getting all the thank yous. And I'm not getting any at all, and that's fine by me, right? Because I'm doing it all. It doesn't worry me that you don't know that I even did it. And we were talking a lot, Mary and I, about our, the blogs that uh, Mary does. And I'm saying, why are you doing these things? Like, why have you got a feedback thing on the blog? Like, why can't you just post what is on the blog on our website and just let it be? Why do you need the interaction? I don't need the interaction. I just place the stuff on the web and I don't even notice what anybody says about it. Like, 
you know, people send me emails about it. I go, oh, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> like, it's not like you know, I just I'm doing my passion. I don't need that. Does that make sense? But if you're doing something and you need that, there's your addiction. You, you need the feedback. You need the response. You need. You see what I'm saying? And and this is what we often do with our children in particular because we're so we have so much guilt and shame and all these other things all adding up with our children in particular that we get to the point where we've got to tell them in advance that we're going to do something you know that that is good for them anyway and god doesn't do that god just does what's right and doesn't do what's wrong that's all god does with you and you don't get some pretty flowery words in your ear saying because god's capable of giving you pretty flowery words in your ear like he made your ear <laughs> So he's capable of communicating with it, do you understand? And the fact that he's not should tell you something. <laughs> do you follow me? Like, to me, like, God's always showing us exactly what God does all the time. People say, oh, I don't hear from God at all. I go, yeah, no, that's understandable. <laughs> and they say, what do you mean? Well, say, well God, you're not going to hear anything from God because God doesn't communicate with your ear. How do you know that? Well, I've never heard anybody in my entire life, I've never observed anyone in the spirit world, anyone when I was in the soul state, I've never observed anybody actually hear a word through their ear from God. Have you? Really? You've heard from, you know, they claim it's God, but it's spirits. No, oh, I see that all the time, but I've never seen it from God. So that tells me it doesn't happen. Why? Because God wants communication with your soul, not with your ear. God knows that when you listen with your ear, most of the time you're not listening anyway, right? unless your feelings are engaged. So I feel like God is already doing and showing you how God deals with addiction. What we need to do is deal with addiction with each other exactly the same way, exactly the same way. So in a relationship, you don't go and sit down with them and say, I, I've decided that I'm not going to uh, feed this addiction of yours anymore. You just don't feed it anymore. That's what God would do. See what happens. And they get all angry and upset. You say, yeah, darling, I just... Uh, then you can, might say, if they ask you why, they, why you're not doing it, well, I decided I was, I'm, I'm feeding your addiction or I, I was feeding one of my own. So I decided to stop. And if they say, why didn't you tell me? And say, why did you need to know? There's another addiction. Right? Because God... God doesn't do that so, so that's where i'd start what does god do with you and then that's what you need to do with everyone else yeah. now god doesn't treat you nasty god still has love for you god has concern for you compassion for you understanding for you god has no judgment for you any of those things so you're not doing all of these things because you want to judge people or harm them or to treat them like you're superior to them or any of those things you just do it because that's what god does because it's the, what God does is the most loving thing in the universe. So, so I, I sort of go like, okay, what's God, what's God doing with me? God's not communicating with me when I have an addiction. So that tells me that God doesn't like any of my addictions. Why doesn't God like any of my addictions? Oh, we've just learnt why. Because I can't have a relationship with my God through my real self like that. I can't, I'm not going to ever have any fun in my life because it's all going to be frenzy, frenetic, you know, compulsions. That's never going to work. That's why God never feeds any of my addictions because he knows me better than I know me. And that's what we need to decide to do ourselves with others, the same thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So... Okay. So my answer to the question you asked would have, been, would have been, well, what does God do? Does God communicate with you first before God stops feeding your addictions? No. So your desire to communicate with your children before you stop feeding their addictions is a addiction, it is an addiction in itself. It's quite simple. Now, you could sit down and decide to talk to them about it if you want, but you've got to be aware that you're probably just feeding one of your own addictions and theirs. And God doesn't do that. And the reason why God doesn't do that is because God knows that if you don't feed the addiction at all, that's the best chance for the person to finish up 
going through the emotional experience which is necessary before the addiction is going to be released. That's what, what God knows. So you've got to trust that. And my experience of God has been that's fantastic. I'm so glad that God's never fed any of my addictions because I tell you what, if God had of, I would still be in them right now because God would be like a monster feeder of addictions if, you, <laughs> if God was the feeder of addictions, you understand? Like, you know, imagine feeling everything from God when you're in total addiction and you're like, whoa, that, 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 I'm going for that, wouldn't it? That's what it would be like. So it's so good that God hasn't done that with me. Otherwise, I would have never learnt anything. Yeah, so that's, that's what I would do in the situation. Yeah. I guess in some ways, I wanted to say this before as well, that I feel like that I've created monsters in my children in doing that, feeding their addiction. You have. It's like a, yeah, and you. a ground for unlovingness. And you so have. I'm just wanting to make sure that this next step is... No, you just want your guilt to go away. Yeah. That's another addiction. So you could choose to feel your guilt. All right. So you just want your guilt to go away. Many parents are like this. You want, once you learn the truth, you want your guilt to go away. So what you do then is you hold, take a whole series of actions, but you tell them every action that you're taking because you, want, you don't want to feel as bad, uh, that you, as bad about yourself as you really feel about having done those things. But what was the, one of the first steps that Mary mentioned to you today? Recognize the feeling of the sin. So you're skipping that one. Like if you truly feel the sin and the effects of the sin, you, you will want to go through the rest of the process. You will. Yeah. So, you know, we're often avoiding the effects of the sin. So hopefully in some of these personal truth sessions, we'll have one at, what's the time now? At three, it's 20 to 3 now. Yeah, so we'll have one at 3. three and if we could have um, Nina and Barb, if we could have the no, two. Nina and Joy. Nina, Nina and Joy, that's right. Because um, it relates to a lot of the information we've been going through. So, so we'll have that at three. Is that all right? Yep. Um, was there any other questions that Mary couldn't answer? That Luli, I couldn't really answer. Rachel, what was Luli's question? Uh, if she we, if finds I just it hard down. to be sensitive to the feeling of the sin. Yeah, it was about... Um, really recognising it emotionally that it's a sin. Yes, uh, you're not even recognising intellectually it's a sin. Yeah, that yeah, too. That's yeah. the issue, isn't it? Like, you know, once you start re recognising intellectually it's a sin, then you go through the intellectual processes of being willing to examine the emotional part of it. Right? So e even intellectually at this point, there's no recognition of the sin. That's because you're not willing to have a good look at all the effects. If you were willing to have a good look at all of the effects of what you do and the reaction it has to your own body, your own life, other people's lives and all of that kind of stuff, you would stop immediately. So what we do is we numb ourselves out of the effect. In other words, we tell ourselves, you know, the, the state statement, it's not that bad, is it? And then you go to other people and you go, it's not that bad, is it? And they go, no. You know why they say no? Because it's something they do as well. And they go, it's not that bad. Definitely not. Right? So we all convince ourselves that it's not that bad. And you know what we've done on the planet now? We've convinced ourselves that abortion's not that bad. So we, we get to the stage with our addictions that we even convince ourselves that killing children is not bad. That's how bad it gets in terms of getting everybody else's approval and acceptance about it. What we need to do is educate ourselves intellectually. How is this bad? What effect does it have on the rest of the world? What effect does it have on me? What effect does it have on my body, my spirit body, my soul? What effect does it have on my relationship with God? To me, anything that stops my relationship with God is automatically bad. <laughs> like, because it's not going to help me grow. What effect does it has on my growth? Does it cause stagnation or does it cause growth? Well, every addiction causes stagnation. That's no good. Like, that's, that's not so good. So educate yourself about the addiction and what it does. And that is going to be a process you have to engage firstly with your mind. And then once you've educated yourself enough, some of the pennies will start dropping into your soul, as the saying goes, and you start feeling like, ah, now I'm starting to feel the effects of what that bad is. You know, I'm starting to feel, like, for example, in the codependent relationship, I'm starting to feel that every time I lie to my partner, 
when she says, or, or, or vice versa, I could say, she, she says, does your bum, my bum look fat? And I say, nah, it's beautiful. Guaranteed to have sex that night, probably, right? If I say that. Now, but if I say, no, your bum looks fairly big now, lady, you know, my love. Um, you've obviously been overeating and you haven't been exercising. You've been doing another a number of other things to not look after yourself. And as a result, it's got wider and wider and wider. And you obviously haven't pro deal dealt with some emotions around this area that, that would cause the weight to go on as well. And, and I say all of that, do you think I'm getting sex tonight? Probably not. Or the next it night, or the needy. next night. It might be needy sex. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. It might be, but, but it's highly unlikely, I would suggest. And the reason why is because, we're, and then when I start seeing, okay, not only that, what's the effect on myself? So firstly, I've lied to her, which actually enables her getting bigger and bigger and bigger in that particular example. But also, I've just lied. How did that affect my relationship with God? How, my willingness to lie under this circumstance demonstrates to me I have lots of fear. So what's the problem there? Like, I'm not willing to tell the truth when I'm asked, even. So there's a problem there. I don't trust the truth. I don't trust that the truth is loving and there's all sorts of issues there. So I, I would be really questioning about all of those issues. Does that make sense? So this is a process. Remember on the first day, I think it was Corny uh, first that introduced the concept of those three reasons why we're so afraid of change. And then Mary introduced the concept of our willingness to change, which was all about our willingness to love. If you're really willing to love, you will find, you will investigate, you will educate yourself, you will go and find out what your addictions do to the world. You won't just sit there and go, oh, I've got no idea. You would actually go out and say and find out, how does this affect you? How does this affect me? How does this affect the world? Like, For example, if the average meat eater on this planet decided to go out and see the effects of their eating of meat, they would be shocked. Because almost all the devastation that's occurred to the natural environment on this planet has occurred through this desire for meat. So they'd be shocked. And then they'd go, okay, is this loving? I can see the effects of my sin. You see? We've got to educate ourselves if we're going to see, ever see the effects of our sin. And, and then, of course, we've got to feel that. But, but we won't even get to feeling it unless we've educated ourselves. Yeah. And that's sort of what I was trying to say when I said a resistance to truth. You know, you're not seeking the truth because truth would actually create, if, if you saw this, the effects of the sin, the truthful effects of the sin, mm -hmm. that would increase your sensitivity to it, I feel. Yeah. So that's a very powerful tool. You have truth is a powerful tool to see, educate yourself with truth, even intellectually. Go and find it. A person who desires change desires education, desires to understand, desires to understand all of these things. And this is something that we need to do for ourselves because the world is not good at it. The world is, might be better at doing things like educating us with a science degree or educating us with some mathematical degree, but even then I'd argue that it's not very good at that because at the end of the day, because it's not got a foundation in love, it, it's not going to be the full truth. It can't be. So, so this is where we need, to, we, we need to see that the world itself has no foundation in love at this point in time. And who, who's going to give us this foundation in love that we desperately need in order to grow? You can't rely on the world to do it, can you? Like Connection with God is going to happen, but in the beginning we haven't even got that. So who's going to have to do it? Well, I am. I'm going to have to seek with my will, as Mary talked about two days ago, I'm going to have to have a very strong will to educate myself in love. And that becomes my life's purpose. Once we do that, we have a chance to grow. And then once we start connecting with God, it's much easier. The emotion of God, of love, flows into our soul. All of a sudden, we become more sensitive to truth, more sensitive to love. And that's wonderful then. You start getting rapid change after that point. Yeah. So it's just this interim stage, the, the dealing with the facade that's so hard because at that stage we're not feeling all those things from God and we're not, we don't even know what the truth is and so we've got to go and seek it. And this is why you know, we've got to seek the truth 
It's, the truth is the thing that sets us free and we've got to understand that statement in our heart. Mm. You know, most of us, we hear that statement. You've heard me say that statement so many times. Most of you have not yet let that statement sink into your heart. Because if you had, you'd be seeking truth every moment of your life. You'd, you'd be discussing it all the time. You wouldn't have this feeling with me of, don't give me any more. <laughs> let, me, let me go away and digest that. You, you wouldn't have that feeling. And it's sometimes, you know, sometimes I meet a person who, who just one after the other questions, who's seeking truth, has an emotional response. And I go, yeah, there's a real seeker of truth. Very rare to find that person on this planet. You know, I think in the last year, I've had an interaction with two or three people who have had that feeling. Yeah. So that's what we need to do. Yeah. And, and you this, get the benefits of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's where I feel the three things that Cornelius highlighted, the, the desire for truth, the, the fear of overwhelm and the lack of faith. If you can address those three areas, then your desire for change just naturally grows. Yeah. yeah. And you also long for education. Yeah, I can feel that because I don't have those things, I'm resistive to doing what AJ is suggesting, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So, so I recommend working. That's what I had to do to, to, yeah. to work on those Honestly, things. Mary's desire for truth is pretty strong, right? Because initially when we met, there were so many addictions in play and she had so much resistance to her emotions, like immense resistance to any emotion that was negative. And if, if it wasn't for her truth, like we would never have, we would have never have got two minutes into, our, <laughs> into a relationship if it wasn't for her desire for truth. You know, at the end, she always had to go away, even when we left and went apart from each other for months at a time. She went away, and she, in the end, what pulled her back is always, I really want the truth at the end of the day. And I'm willing to, if, if I'm, I'm scared stiff of my emotions, but, I, you know, I really want the truth, and I want the truth more than I, I'm scared of my emotions. And I want the truth more than I'm afraid of being overwhelmed by my emotions and I want the truth more than I, more than I lack faith in God. You know, I want, just want the truth. And that's going to be something that draws you, you know, as an as incredibly strong pull into doing the rest of the work that needs to be done. Yeah. But it's a great question, Lily. It's the biggest issue that most people have. Most people have that issue. And... And most people do not see the actions they take as a sin, as an un. See, we talk about. We see the problem with using the word an unloving action is it's very tame, isn't it? But if I say the word sin, you get some more stronger uh, feelings inside of yourself about the negativity of the actual unloving behaviour. So I can say sin is unloving behaviour and you go, okay, from now on I'll use the term unloving behaviour. <laughs> and then we go, oh, it's just unloving behaviour. It's just unloving behaviour. Not thinking that that's the worst thing. The worst thing we can engage is in unloving behaviour. You know, from God's perspective, it doesn't matter what you know. You can know nothing, and not that you would, if, and have as long as you had no unloving behaviour, from God's perspective, everything's perfect. <laughs> right? Now, it's impossible to know nothing and have no unloving behaviour, of course, because that, an, that's an oxymoron and it can never happen. The reality is, as we engage love, we know lots of things. That's what will happen. But, but if we took the worst case scenario and said we know nothing at all but to be loving, from God's perspective... Bang, that's, that's the most beautiful thing you could have ever decided to do. And we've got to start seeing it like that. Love is the most important thing. Mary said this in her talk to you on, on, on Saturday. Love is the most important thing you could ever learn about. Are you treating it like it's the most important thing you could ever learn about? Or are you just going, oh, no, it's another unloving behavior. <laughs> that was funny. Like, you know, this is what we do, isn't it? Like, we do do that. We laugh about it. We you know, make jokes about it, we do all but we don't treat it like the important thing it is. 
So when it comes to love, you know from my own from knowing me for a while, I'm very serious about it. <laughs> right? Because it is the biggest thing in your life, my life, and in the universe that governs everything. So why wouldn't you firstly engage in education in it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I've had my little <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you back here in 10 minutes for a personal truth session with Joy and Nina. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.